Like Jiao said, I'm an experimental physicist by day, but I'm going to tell you today about some fun I had this past winter um, adding a new feature to the GLA compiler. Uh, this is work that was influenced greatly and, and appreciated a lot. Um, fruitful discussions with uh, this group of people that you see here, as well as a few others. Uh, so a few words about why you should care about bounce check elimination, or bounce checking in general. Uh, you might be surprised to learn there, there are people that keep track of software security vulnerabilities uh, sort of across all software in the wild. Um, and buffer errors account for some dramatic fraction of all security vulnerabilities, uh, even today in, in 2016. Uh, you know, why are we in that situation today? It's because kind of older programming languages did not give you um, bounds checking for free. It was something that the compiler had to do manually. Uh, some people have, you know, labeled this one of C's biggest mistakes, for instance. Um, but it's not just a security problem, it's also kind of a usability trap. Um, you know, many people in this audience probably uh, in their day-to-day -day experience have to uh, move between programming languages. I bet a few of you have done this. You've forgotten for a moment that Julia's one index and wrote a piece of co code like this. Um, fortunately, Julia doesn't seg fault. It, it produces an error. And the reason it does is because behind the scenes it's doing a transformation like this, right? It's, it's transforming that, uh, that uh, index lookup into something which verifies first that that index is valid before actually doing, giving you a response. And so there, when you looked at the, at the zeroth element of, of the array A, um, you know, you got a runtime error that allows you to find your, your bug as opposed to just seg faulting, which would be a lot less helpful. Um, so this is great. This is uh, a huge usability boon. But you might wonder if this is coming at the expense of performance. And of course, it would uh, if every uh, array access had to do a bounds check, uh, particularly in Julia, because uh, Errors, uh, exceptions create garbage collection frames, and so even the possibility of, of a branch is kind of a performance trap. Um, but you know, greedy, Julia is a greedy language, so we, we want to have both safety and performance. And so there is a sort of well-trodden path here to get both. And, and the way you do it is effectively by, um, you need two ingredients. You need to hoist bound checks outside of loops. Um, so that you effectively check just once that all array accesses with inside, a, inside of a loop are going to be valid. And then at particular, inside the loop, you essentially opt out at that point because you know that that, that uh, access is OK. Uh, and, and then you don't, you don't do the bounds check. So um, this sort of thing has existed in Julia for a while now, um, but it was uh, a bit special to just the built-in array type. Uh, if you had a user-defined uh, implementer of abstract array, or even other uh, array types in, in base Julia like subarray, effectively you had to make this Faustian bargain between safety and performance. And we wanted to fix that. We wanted to be able to have uh, other places have both. And so the design that we came up with for user, user extensible bounds check elimination effectively has a few ingredients. Uh, one is a new macro called uh, at bounds check that is used to, to, to decorate a block of code as something which does bounds checking. And then when the compiler sees such a block of code inside of a, another block that's labeled with this inbounds macro, it knows that it can elide or remove that block of code. Um, now, this has a bit of an interesting interaction with inlining. Uh, one of the things we worry about in the design is that you could have in your, in your call chain, you could have one block of code you know, several layers deep uh, in, in an inlining tree uh, from another block of code which had an inbounds. And now you have this very non-local interaction between two pieces of code that change the behavior. And that seemed bad to us. Uh, so we decided to add an additional rule here, which is that um, we would only elide bounds checks if they were at the same level or one layer deep in, in, the, in the call graph. Um, and furthermore, we actually, the implementation requires inlining, which seems like maybe it's a bit of a, a, a limitation, but actually a, a function call turns out to be more expensive than a typical bounds check. So there's not a lot of performance to be gained if you're not inlining anyway. So the way that this works inside the compiler is that the, the code generator keeps track of two, of two stacks, the, two data, the data structures that use are two stacks. And then we have uh, meta expressions that we inject into the abstract syntax tree to manipulate these stacks. So there's this uh, expression with a bounds check header and one with an inbounds header. And basically, the, the other part of the expression is, is pushing or popping values off, the, off these stacks. And so the bounds check macro basically wraps uh, a block of code in something which pushes on a true and then pops it off the bounds check stack. 
and the inliner uh, and the inbounds macro will will push on an inbounds uh, will push on a true and pop it off, and the inliner similarly has to do uh, some kind of um, manipulation of these stacks, and the code generator effectively uh, reads the expressions in the AST sequentially. And the equivalent of our one level of in inlining rule effectively means you have to examine these two stacks. And if you find the right values in the, in, in the right place, then that means you can actually just skip uh, emitting uh, code for a particular expression. So that's kind of what's happening under the hoods. Uh, when we went to take this new feature and, and use it to rewrite um, the uh, array, abstract array interface in base, uh, we discovered a bit of a problem uh, with this one level of inlining rule in that it seemed to have a conflict with the way that we wanted to write our code. If you look at the abstract array code, we, we lean very, very heavily on, on dispatch in order to, to specialize to particular methods. So we specialize on traits of different, array, of different types of arrays, whether a fast or slow lin, uh, linear indexing, for instance. And we specialize, specialize on the types of the indexer, whether it's like a range or, or a, a, an integer or a real and so on. And so we actually do have exactly this situation where the implementer of, of a particular get index or set index method can actually be very far away in the call graph from the place where you want to mark it as, as being inbounds. And so we needed a, an extra mechanism to, in, to, to opt in to sort of passing along an inbounds context through one of these chains. And so that's why there is this propagate inbounds macro, to, macro that you can use to, to mark a function to, to say that I want to borrow whatever the context I was called in, whatever inbounds context I was called in. So let's get into an example. Uh, so I, I guess I, just to finish that thought off, if you look at, for instance, the, the, the top level implementer of git index in base uh, has exactly this kind of structure um, where it's kind of dispatching on a trait of the abstract array or it wants to pass along inbounds. So let's get into an example. Uh, so say that you really like zero indexing. You want to you, uh, uh, define a new vector type that is a zero indexed vector. vector. Uh, so you define your type, um, and then you look up in the docs for the Ray interface, Julia's Ray interface, and find out that you should define uh, size for, for your new type. And now the critical piece when um, to, to, to get this fast perf uh, and, uh, and safe uh, bounds checking behavior is that when you implement git indexed for your custom type, uh, you have a couple ingredients. One is you're going to mark this as inline uh, so, that, uh, so that this is a cheap function call, uh, that, it that it will get inlined into the caller. Uh, you're going to call uh, check bounds on the, the index that's been passed in. Uh, and, and you're going to mark that as, as something which is doing bounds checking. And, and then you're finally, in an inbounds context, going to actually do the, the array lookup. So the fact that this is zero indexed versus one index is basically this plus one here, right? Um, so, and, so you can look at this and you just think, well, maybe I need to implement check bounds. And if you do have a very complicated uh, type of structure, maybe you do. But actually, uh, in the very latest uh, version of the array, Julia's array interface, most of the time you can get away with just defining the, this indices uh, uh, method for your type, which for a particular dimension returns the, the range of valid indices for that. And that's going to be called by check bounds. And this is it. You're done. Uh, this is now something which is both uh, fast and, um, and safe. So some final thoughts. Um, there are some compiler flag, some command line flags you can use to change the global behavior of bounds checking. You can either have it always or never. Um, um, if you don't provide one of these flags, you get the behavior that I just described with this kind of one level deep uh, removal. Uh, of course, we'd like in the future versions of Julia to do some of the, this hoisting and, and marking automatically. Um, and actually, we learned earlier that like Parallel Accelerator can do some of this for you. There's also a Julia Summer of Code uh, project that's going on right now, which is trying to use some of the tools that are built into LLVM's Poly project to try to infer places where it can do this hoisting automatically. So that's something to look for, for forward to in the future. So that's it. Thank you.